a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Graz, which means I woke up this morning at 5.30, so if sometimes you see my eyes rolling a bit, that, that's, uh, that's why. Um, also, know that you are probably quite tired, you had a long day, so I'll try to read your eyes and see how much I should kind of move on and skip or go faster. Um, so, yes, my title is a little bit uh, metaphorical indeed, but I'll try to explain uh, what I mean by that. The idea is that I'll try to use some example from projects that I either worked on directly or that I know about um, to uh, explore what digital humanities means to me and how the involvement with historical uh, primary sources coming from a digital humanities perspective might look like, what it might reveal, what it might conceal. Um, and I start, um, as I tend to start nowadays in my uh, uh, seldom classes on digital humanities from a definition of digital humanities, which is quite, um, I think, wide, uh, from a handbook, in fact, of a, a master uh, teaching uh, class in India uh, by Raymond Ray, where she says that digital humanities explores how the questions posed in humanities scholarship are transformed and extended by the digital both by means of tools and epistemologies. And if you've read a little bit of digital humanities literature, you will know that some of us might tend to be involved more with the tools, some are more focused on the epistemologies, but it's indeed when these two things um, interwine and interconnect that interesting things tend to happen. Um, so to a certain extent, um, the idea of humanities scholarship being intertwined with formal and empirical studies is not new, and it goes back at least to early modern, an early modern European context. There are now three volumes, I think, on the history of the humanities written by this a group that started in the Netherlands, and it's quite known internationally now. They're, they're holding every year a, a conference on the history of the humanities, where they kind of um, put forward lots of evidence to show how the humanities in that context at least deeply influence and even shape the new sciences. So to a certain extent, it's as if the digital humanities is a kind of a renewed connection to formal and empirical studies. Um, so in this brief and counter-brief overview, I like to contribute to this idea of, yes, so the digital humanities is a connection to formal and empirical studies, in what way is it different from all the formal and empirical uh, humanities approaches? And of course I won't answer these questions, but Ideally, hopefully, my, my contribution will be a provocation uh, to address this. Um, so, as, as Georg said, I tried to use this metaphor of the lens for at least two reasons. I'm not an historian of technology, not a historian of science, uh, but I think it's well known to everybody that the lens is a scientific optical instrument since a long time, at least since Galileo. If you go to Florence to the Museum of Science there, you will see, I think, at least two telescopes that we used. In one case, we even have the lens. Um, and of course, since then, well, Galileo, of course, used, used this telescope. Um, in some cases, it is believed that he built it himself to uh, do his famous discoveries, such as the Craters of the Moon, which he then published in 1610. But and since then, of course, the optical instruments have been used in all sorts of research uh, to study uh, from the universe, uh, our cosmos, but also microorganisms, and we could extend, uh, of course, uh, this idea of the scientific instrument to other non-optical um, uh, tools too. But indeed, the lens remains a metaphor in that sense. We use it a lot in our common language as well. Um, there is also another interesting, um, I think, uh, meaning in the lens, though, as a kind of a knowledge machine. Um, and for this, I, I recall um, the idea of optical as being used in art, especially in the Renaissance. It's well known that the camera obscura and other kind of lenses were used to produce uh, various works of art. Um, you probably have, have come across this uh, contemporary uh, English painter who lived in the US for a long time, David Ockney, who kind of um, reproduced some of these uh, Renaissance paintings using. Uh, the camera obscura himself, so he reproduced them to show uh, or to kind of demonstrate this uh, Ockney Falco thesis, so called, according to which indeed these artists use the lenses to uh, produce um, their many of their of their works. Lenses, camera obscura, and different optical aids. And it's very interesting because in his case, of course, art historians have said that before it was known, but he he has a visual argument. He proved it with a by doing it by using the lenses and the camera obscura itself, recreating what he calls the Great Wall. 
Um, so why am I saying this? Because I think it's useful to use this metaphor with these two senses, of, as a lens as a scientific instrument, so our digital humanities tool and projects seen in that sense, but also as a way of creating and studying our cultural production. So what is it that we see uh, via the lenses of this uh, digital humanities, uh, of digital humanities research and digital humanities project? It's all just a uh, uh, lie? Is it all uh, just uh, deceiving ourselves, or what is it? Well, first of all, of course, we point these lenses towards our object of analysis. And this is very uh, fitting the purpose of humanities itself, so the specificity of the object we study. In what way? Well, first of all, of course, via digitization. I don't know whether this is one of the topics you also addressed already today in the class, but via the digitization of primary sources, one of the ways in which we examine closely our objects. Um, and if we use, uh, for instance, Terra's definition of what digitization is, she says, well, digitization involves the creation of a binary representation of an object which already exists, rather than the creation of new and novel uh, pictorial information. Um, but of course, we also know that this does not mean that just because it's representation of an object that already exists, there are not interpretative decisions involved. So it is an interpretative act as well, and we make choices and take decisions in these digitization processes. So the simplest way in which, indeed, we, uh, via humanity, digital humanities project, we observe and access, uh, make available our, our primary sources are by providing powerful, quite simple but powerful displays. So for instance, in the end of the finals project, which I was involved now almost a year ago, um, we, uh, we engaged with the National Archives in, in, in London in the UK to uh, digitize this material to a certain standard so that we could then, in addition to our digital edition, which is actually more a calendar rather than a, an edition, this is when we get transcription, it's a translation of these Latin documents, we made available all this material online with a, at the time, quite simple technology, which is called uh, Zoomify. Now there are uh, various open versions of similar software to do similar things. So you could zoom in uh, and make uh, these digitized images available to, to the public. By the way, the project was mainly funded by public money. So this is, of course, one way in which we, we can make the specificity of our objects um, available to our observation, but we also, via digitization, uh, go forward to uh, engage with minute examination and reconstruction of features of these sources. So, for instance, some of you might have uh, come across the uh, Archimedes Palimpsest project, which was one of uh, maybe the first, definitely one of the best, best funded uh, enterprise in analyzing a specific uh, manuscript, one single manuscript. Um, which is a palimpsest. So indeed, there, there is a double script, one that goes, uh, that you can read uh, horizontally, and one at the bottom of the page, which is vertical. And the Archimedes text, which was the one, of course, that the, uh, the scholars were interested in because it's very rare, there are many uh, copies of these writings, uh, was underneath and was not visible. So to these manuscript technologies were applied multispectral imaging, x-ray, and so on, until uh, combinations of uh, in this case, Greek scholars or interpreters of Archimedes and philosophers and historians uh, got together and managed to finally visualize some of these texts, which is, of course, very important, partially because those texts didn't exist in other forms, and in some cases, some of those texts did exist in other editions, but it was possible finally to compare and come up uh, with a better idea of what the original text of Archimedes might look like. Very interesting for the Historians were also the fact that in some of the pages of the palimpsest they could actually visualize the diagrams, which were again even more rare. Um, I don't think actually uh, tested. Uh, it, there was no evidence of it before in this form. And as I said, also X-ray technology was applied. Um, so a combination of material sciences uh, tests on, on this material to finally reveal a text that was not visible. And if we move from these textual sources to, for instance, art historical sources, we have, of course, application of computational techniques on that front, too, and more and more so. This is, for instance, an example from um, uh, a collaboration uh, with uh, uh, computer scientists working on what they call now the fingerprints of the canvas of, of, 
of the painting. So in this case, we have two paintings by the, by the Dutch painter Vermeer, and what the analysis of what they call the weave digital map of the canvas show that these two uh, paintings might have actually been originally conceived to be together. They come from the same uh, canvas uh, pattern. They have the same canvas pattern. So it, it's very uh, then uh, uh, evident that we, we can imply that in these examples that I show, digital humanity is, is very much connected, of course, to material cultural approaches, so, so to ethnographic analysis, the reconstruction of biographies of objects, but also to, on the, let's say, hard sciences side, to material sciences themselves. And he combined these two approaches in interesting ways. What else can we say about the way in which we see our objects via the lenses of this project? Yes, the specificity, but also in combination with formal modeling. And I'm sure this center has, must have reflected a lot on what modeling means, so I'm not going to go too far into that. <coughs> the idea that in addition to this, you have to balance out somehow the specificity of, job, of the object you work with with abstracting some, some of those uh, features of those objects to make for instance, algorithms that can play with those features, or classification, manipulation of those models. So in addition to uh, digitization, for instance, uh, we might uh, balance out the specificity with formal modeling by the creation and manipulation of specific digital models of these primary sources, whether of the old sources themselves or components of them or the history of their production, transmission, and use. Um, one of the examples I have for this is, um, is a model, a formal model of handwriting taken from the DigiPAL project, which is a project on digital paleography uh, developed at King's College London, which is now ended in theory, but the work of the project, fortunately, because there are these models and this very, very uh, detailed documentation behind it, behind it is continuing into new projects. So the models that are being used on other handwriting is originally started with a vernacular uh, Anglo English script, vernacular script, and it's now evolved into being used in other, for other hand writing. Now, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is a model of what hand writing is. So, what are the graphics, what are the characters, how can we uh, ex uh, explain to a computer how the components of these character characters can be modeled, what, is, what a hand, what does hand mean, what, what does script mean, what does uh, style mean in a formalized uh, language. Um, oops, I can see it here, but I can't see it there. And if we move again from kind of text, primary sources fo focusing on, on text, to uh, primary sources that might focus, for instance, on sculptures, we have a similar or comparable approach by which uh, there is a kind of digital acquisition of some of the features uh, of an object, which are uh, either by a kind of top down process uh, abstracted so that they can be. Uh, approach with computational models that are being thought of before by an analysis which precedes the digital acquisition, or a combination by which the digital acquisition uh, involves also the uh, extraction of some features that then become relevant for the study of those models. So in this specific case, for instance, it's interesting how these actually are sculptures that come from Sardinia, where I'm from, so that's why I was interested in showing it to you. Uh, so it's not at all an historical period that I'm very familiar with, with but I'm, I'm very attracted to is part of my heritage. And, and what they did, they, they kind of compared via the digital models uh, the kind of models themselves of Nuragi, which are these uh, prehistorical towers that you'll find all over Sardinia, so the real Nuragi, and the models that the Nuragic people, the late stage of the Nuragic people, built of those Nuragi. And they compare the, the, the similarity across, for instance, the proportions of this, uh, the models and the, the real uh, features and so on. So it's another example of how you can manipulate uh, those models and reflect on those objects further. But of course, at the digital edition summer school, what we are interested in, uh, it's also the text that these primary sources contain. And so we're interested in, uh, in the digital models of those texts, and in the case of historical sources, on the digital model of the historical entities that these texts uh, um, somehow make emerge. Um, so a classic example, of course, is, um, for instance, uh, this uh, snippet from uh, the Epidoc Thailand. Uh, today, was the text encoding initiative already introduced? Okay. So the Epidoc is a set of guidelines which build on the text encoding initiative. So they use the text encoding initiative guidelines, but they kind of uh, focus on ancient texts, and in particular on inscriptions and text on papyrus mainly. 
So this is a, a very simple snippet where you have, I, I hope even if you don't know what XML is, you recognize it is the Greek word there, and part of that Greek word, almo, is um, uh, contained within this, within this, this tag that said supply. So that part of that word has been added by the editor. And the reason why it's been added is because it was lost, so there's nothing there in the original store, so there's a scratch or it's not visible. And the, the editor is not very sure about this, this addition. Uh, so the certitude of that statement is low. Um, and what's interesting is that these this epilogue guidelines not only model those kind of statements you can make on that text, and they, they suggest various ways in which this textual phenomena can be uh, modeled and encoded, but they also engage in how you transform them, you transform this tag, the encoded text, into a way that is publishable according to the editorial conventions that certain uh, traditions follow. So in this case, the data bank style would render this text in this way. So the supply text is in square brackets, and the, the fact that it's uncertain is expressed with a question mark. So what does this, this tell us about, again, digital humanities and its uh, uh, connection with, in this case, formal and empirical uh, approaches connected to text? Well, first of all, of course, the fact that it's very much connected and intertwined with textual critical scholarship, but also with publishing frameworks. And the two things aren't entirely so, se so separate as they tend to be in traditional textual scholarship. Um, I also mentioned historical entities. So these other examples, um, Cosine would worked a lot on prosopographical projects. Prosopograph pros prosopography, for those of you who don't know about it, is a, a way of writing biographies of historical uh, characters, uh, persons, let's say, when you don't have lots of information about these single individuals but you write kind of biographies by groups. You have a certain amount of sources, and out of these sources you extract information so that, I don't know, you can maybe create a biography of a certain family or a certain uh, group of uh, people involved in a certain role in society and so on. Um, so in, 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 the, in, the, in various prosopographical projects that were developed at King's College London when I was working, this was the model that they used. The idea was that uh, they wanted to express by a factoid any assertion made in the historical sources. So anything that was somehow evident in the source and that connected, involved a certain person, in this specific case, because we're talking about charters, involved also possession, um, could be related to a place, so usually that factor happened in that place. Um, and what's interesting about this is that, in this case, what they're modeling are mainly the entities of the text. So the data structure is built around the historical entities rather than the linear text as we were looking at before. And this kind of approach allows you, of course, to uh, then develop a certain data structure with which, you, with which you can do various things. So for instance, in the people of medieval Scotland, which is one of the prosopographical mm -hmm. projects I didn't work on, but it follows a similar model, they are also working with network analysis. What does this mean? So they're looking at the, the they've of course identified all the people in these sources, the roles these people have, uh, for instance, within the charters. And based on all this information and this uh, structural, structured model, they can, for instance, uh, visualize when the same witnesses occur in a corpus of charters, which of course for historians can be quite important. At a glance, you can say, ah, I can see that, I don't know, this certain group of witnesses witness together in this period all the time, which may be a sign of something. I am still sometimes a bit skeptical about some of these visualizations because they tend to be difficult to read, um, but I think that they have potentially need to, uh, to reveal, let's say, to give us an another perspective on those objects. Um, another example, for instance, they have the, the, the blue balloons here are the women, while the green ones are the men. And I think that the, the fuchsias are the hairs. And what, was the, what the historians showed me when we were looking at this is that it's interesting to see how the women tend to be a link between different families. So again, something that historians of medieval Scotland knew, or kind of knew, but they can visualize it and, and show it to you based on those uh, digital models that they manipulated. Um, and obviously, these examples I mentioned are kind of looking at with a kind of very, uh, if we could say, maybe focused lens of sh um, on, on specific features of the text. But there are projects that look at a much wider, that have a much wider aperture, you can say, if we look at the, photo, we use the photographic metaphor. 
So this, this, for example, is a kind of meta model of events, and now you can model historical events connected to narratological events. So in this case, um, Dan and, and Schumacher are looking at how can we, in general, historical events, whether they're fictional or uh, factual, we can identify elements that we can compute to understand what an event, uh, how an event can be uh, described, and what's the similarity between fictional and factual events, um, and so on. So in this case, the, the lens is really wide, we could say. What's interesting, I think, in this, in this analysis of, of objects from, from the humanities project perspective is that you tend to blend perspectives, not necessarily in a confusing way, but enriching uh, different approaches. So, for instance, uh, you might uh, tend to depart from a textual perspective, but then, out of necessity, while you develop your model, you realize that it's very important to include contextual information or material information and so on, or the other way around. Um, this one is, for instance, an example that I took from the Medea project that you're involved in, uh, Georg. So, Medea project, if I understand correctly, uh, would like to um, produce and give recommendation on creating digital edition of accounts of different kinds, so many historical and from different periods. I'm not going to explain in detail um, this, this graph, but what I wanted to highlight was in this combination of text and context. So, in this model of these accounts, you have some information, some, let's say, um, components of the model which relate to the physical document where these accounts are recorded, but you also have, of course, information about where the transfers, uh, the content, the conceptual, the, the text is expressing, is telling uh, what happened in a specific time and what kind of transfer is taking place in that document, the charter, for instance, so information specifically about the text and the information in the text. Of course, about the historical entities connected to that transfer, so for instance, uh, from whom or from what person or what organization the transfer came from, to whom it was directed, how much money or how much uh, financial um, substance uh, was involved in this transaction. And then you also have context connected to the, the event that created that document, which in a kind of library uh, mind we could call metadata about, about that document. So, this was just to give you an idea of the, some of these models, like in this case, this is based on the stock CRM um, uh, model, which it was ma mainly built to document museums and library collections. All these different perspectives are encountered, and you potentially could represent only some of them. But the, the idea is that if you engage with the model in its entirety, potentially you could represent all these different facets of the document. Um, another example is, for instance, the fact that you might start or you might be interested in a historical perspective on certain objects of study, uh, but then you tend to also enlarge that perspective to other epistemic tradition or other, uh, other disciplines, such as linguistics, for instance, which is quite common. This is uh, another project uh, which, um, with which I try to um, exemplify that, the Ellespont project, which um, is based in Berlin, and it's a kind of uh, um, connection of already existing projects, one in particular about the Thucydides, um, uh, one of the works of Thucydides where, where he narrates, uh, if, you, if you know a little bit about Greek history, uh, the wars between Athens and Sparta, and another, another big project which is called the Perseus Digital Library, which is one of the main resources for digital classes studies. Um, again, I, I don't want to explain in detail, but what's interesting in this project is that, again, they are the the people involved in the project were interested in uh, recording the events uh, in these uh, classical sources of different kinds, even if they used to see this as a, as a model. And they did so by, again, using TEI, uh, which you've learned of, uh, about today, uh, but also by examining the literature <coughs> about th these historians and checking what kind of events to see that might have recorded based on what the, the literature uh, said. And in addition to that, they also used computational linguistics tools. So the text of Thucydides was also parsed via natural language processing techniques. So the, the event extraction is partially done manually. So there are editors that actually encode the text in TI. It's partially done via extracting information from, uh, from the literature about those texts. And it's also partially done via a very detailed event analysis on the, the sentence level. So things like that person went from here to there in that 
in that moment. And this very peculiar, uh, very um, local uh, type of event is then connected with the wider events such as like, you know, a specific battle or a conquest and so on. So again, a uh, kind of mixed methods and uh, multiple uh, approaches uh, coming together. And last but not least, in this case, the interface that they also um, adopted for the project, it's of course mainly a textual interface, so you would have your Greek text of Thucydides in this case, uh, in which you could highlight specific historical entities, like place names or personal names, in this case, uh, Themistocles, for instance. Um, and you could decide to concentrate on these entities and find information about these entities connected to other sources within the library, and that's done by a linked data framework about which I'm not going to say too much, but that's interesting. It means that they've done lots of analysis and they've added information about these entities outside that specific source, connecting it to other sources, but also they've shown it in a kind of cartographic view. So they're also not only modeling time, uh, events in the text, but they're also modeling space. And it's, this tends to be more and more, again, an approach that has been used in the digital humanities project, this expansion towards a different coordinates, if you like, of, uh, of perspectives. So, so far I concentrate mainly on objects. Another element that I think comes into focus in the engagement with digital humanities pro projects uh, connected to uh, historical sources is, of course, the medium that we use, the tools that we use. I don't have a better word, I think medium is, is rich, rich enough to show that. The machine we use, the software and hardware, both software and hardware. And um, what do I mean by that word? Well, first of all, uh, of course, the digital medium becomes our, it is our publication medium, so the focus is on, on the medium as a way to make whatever we produce uh, available in public. Also, both on the constraints, so the fact that this is still, in a way, our tool that we hammer to try and make it work, uh, but also on the, on the, on the opportunities. And uh, I don't have, I'm sure, to explain to an audience that it's younger than me, um, mainly younger than me, the kind of things you can do with your iPhone and visualize your text in the beautiful, um, beautiful apps that can do all sorts of things. And the examples, again, that I use uh, often to, to explain this is, a, I think, a, an example that everybody, even those who, who do not work with, uh, with medieval uh, text can understand. It's, again, from the Fine Rose project where we had to produce, we wanted to produce um, a digital edition and also print edition out of the same model the same editorial model and the same digital uh, data, uh, which we did, great, and this was the flexibility of the digital medium, it was lots of work, but it was great, and we managed to do it. This is our, how the, the normal page of the web edition looks like, and this is how the print edition looks like, which follows specific <laughs> edition of, of calendars, English calendars. But a very, a very simple challenge is to make sure that these two editions are citable and make sure that historians can use them in a seamless way, in a smooth way. Um, in this case, for instance, each, each entry is numbered. It is a very, I didn't say, but the find rules are, again, the kind of record finds uh, that are uh, issued by the king, in that case, Henry III, so it's the 13th century, for exchange of, of very, various um, benefits for those that pay those fines. Um, so the, the fines are quite short documents that basically saying this person is giving to the king this amount of money to do this and things like that. So lots of names, reaching names, reaching dates, uh, reaching places and, and subjects. Um, so each entry is numbered and of course you have to be numbered in the same way, both in the digital and the print edition. The digital edition is version more, of course, of the print edition, which finishes when a volume is published. So how can we make sure that, for instance, the footnote system is the same, even if with the digital edition might encounter some changes? How can we make sure that these, these two products can be used together and they're both solid academic references? Uh, and this is, of course, the point where then I highlight the fact that digital humanities is, of course, connected to informational studies, archive, archival and library studies, much more than other humanities disciplines. And the fact, of course, a digital humanist, so if you one day, uh, or if you already do define yourself as a digital humanist, if you will want to be defined as such, I think have a very, uh, have a very important responsibility, especially when dealing with historical sources, of creating what, what will be the new intermediaries to our past. Um, so it's very important, I think, to recognize this, that we're not just playing with, of course, we're also playing with a new toy. Uh, 
but we're also creating indeed new sources that will, in theory, are here to stay. New, new resources, sorry. Um, second element, of course, on one end, the publication, me the, 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 the medium as a publication uh, platform, but also uh, the machines as a means of for operationalizing our concepts. So how we create our data sets, how are our algorithms made to work with historical sources, reflecting on these things is part of what the Digital Humanities Project, dealing with primary sources, is putting into focus. And so, for instance, nowadays it's uh, quite a very common in the Digital Humanities to have the application, or to, to experiment with the application of big data analytics. How do they correlate, how do these techniques, these statistical methods uh, correlate with uh, historical uh, or in fact literary sources? And the, the most common example, which probably again most of you have encountered before, is the Google Books Ngram, where with a click you can uh, search very wide corpus of mainly English uh, books and uh, apparently uh, get an immediate graph of the popularity of the term in that corpus. And uh, it's, it, of course, a very powerful tool again, uh, which shows uh, what you can do if the data set is structured and so on. But it also, um, I think it's very useful, and I use it with students to also show the limitations of this, of this, um, of both the data set we built, now we build them, but also the algorithm. So in this specific case, uh, it's very well known that the Google book, book Books corpus contains lots of OCR errors, which means that in the digitization process, um, the, the, the images of the text weren't always recognized properly as text. Um, there is a dominance of scientific literature in that corpus, and if you're fine with it in your search, that's fine, but you need to be aware of how this data set is built. The, the metadata tend to be messy for various reasons, and sometimes also the data are inaccurate. So there are, for instance, uh, entity recognition, uh, which uh, recognize the wrong person or the wrong organization associated with the text. And maybe more importantly for us, uh, this idea of oper operationalizing content, what does popularity really mean? If you have an author that is represented more in that corpus, that doesn't mean necessarily, and, and that author might use a certain word more, that's, that doesn't necessarily mean that that was the, user, the word that was used most, or that was the author that was used most, just because it's represented more in that corpus. Um, the third point, so in addition, of course, we become very aware of the technologies themselves. On one hand, digital humanities um, researchers want to be at the forefront of new technological development, we want to know, we want to be, uh, let's say, at the top of the wave of what's happening. But again, coming from a humanities perspective, we're also very aware of the ethical um, environment in which we need to operate. This is uh, an image of one of the biggest uh, sweep, um, kind of waste, e-waste, um, sites in London. Um, I mean, it's amazing to see how much uh, we waste every day. And if we say, to recommend to, let's say, our university students, or indeed our whole university, oh, from today you should change all your computers in your lab instead of update, or from today you should stop using this software, you should buy this, this other one instead. What does that mean? And, and what about those, those uh, areas in the globe where some of the software, or some of the, the, the devices we use are not available? It's an interesting uh, group, uh, part of indeed the, um, uh, the bigger international association umbrella of the United Organization for Global Outlook, which looks at some of these issues and has come up with this uh, definition, this group called minimal computing, where they think exactly of what does it mean to be involved with technologies from this perspective, and as humanity scholars, how can we make sure um, that we engage with these issues as well? Of course, the open source. Uh, uh, community is one of the ways in which one can get involved with this issue. So what, what, what do we kind of conclude out of this reflection on machines and medium since from these lenses? Well, of course, digital humanities is kind of akin to the techno sciences, to those uh, sciences that use uh, computational uh, and in general engineering uh, facilities and resources and technologies and so on, and also to research, ma it is very much research management aware. We tend to operate with a bigger project that tend have, uh, to need more financial support than the common or the average humanities project. 
So we rely on technical infrastructure, like the center, of course, uh, for instance, uh, is witness of. And our research tends to be a bit higher budget than the normal humanities research. So this is one point. But on the other end, we're also critical of infrastructure. So we are aware that infrastructure isn't neutral. And that any decision that is made on infrastructure has implications. And somebody has, in fact, also suggested that this might be infrastructure itself might be a bit of an outdated metaphor because it implies uh, infra, so from below, something that is there, like indeed the water coming from the tanks, that doesn't really have, um, it doesn't surface, it's something there that we use as a support. Um, Andrew Prescott recently, in a, in a workshop on infrastructure, said this, within digital humanities, the idea of infrastructure is particularly unhelpful because it encourages the prejudice that digital works is supporting activity, subsidiary to research and teaching. And further, in the same seminar, Alan Liu um, said that basically in digital humanities we use technology self-reflexively um, as part of the very knowledge and not just instrument of research and acting ethically in society, which I think touches also on the, on the topic I was mentioning before. Um, I think this is then my last point on, on the medium itself. Um, Digital humanities also, uh, because of, of the possibilities of uh, creating a kind of participatory environment, again, using the medium and the opportunities of the medium, um, is more and more being connected to public humanities, so to the idea that, in general, we have this public funding, we make these resources available. Well, it's not just a one-way process. Let's also involve the public in uh, working on these resources, so that, at least from outside, it seems quite successful is this project being uh, developed in Ireland, le Letters of 1916, University of Maynooth, uh, where uh, letters written by, I think, mainly Irish or Irish residents um, in, in that year were collected not, not only from archives and museums and institutions, public institutions, but also from private collections. And the public itself could then use a simplified uh, encoding model and a simplified tool to transcribe these letters. And obviously, via workshops and by, by our social media and other interaction, it was a way, in a way, to also uh, give back this heritage um, to the people, to the collective uh, memory. So in a way, I'm just trying to say that, I guess, from machines, again, from this perspective, we get, we get back to an idea of a humane project. So it's not just about the technology in this uh, arid, um, arid landscape. And then my last, my third element, so I talked about objects, I talked about uh, machines and media, and my, my last element is about the observers. What do I mean by that? I mean that this involvement with, the, with this project, this metaphor of the lens, is also useful because it makes us aware of ourselves, of our sub subjectivity. Um, so the, we, I mentioned the various digital models before, the various choices and decisions that one takes, um, and the link is evident between those models and, and us, as observers, our creators, our interpreters of, of these resources, of these models. And there is, of course, a complex boundary between the factual observation of the past and its context of interpretation. And this is, again, an element which connects digital humanities very much to the core of the humanities, which value subjectivity, which doesn't mean a relativism, it's a different thing. Um, and, of course, when I use the word observer because, again, it, it's... Uh, uh, within this metaphor of, of, uh, of the lens, and in general, of course, in, uh, in the idea of scientific instrument and so on, but it's the agency that I want really to highlight. So the fact that um, we make choices, whether they're intellectual or technical, they tend to be connected. And this is why those uh, humanity scholars that think we can work with them separately, they decide what to do and then they tell us how to do it. They, I don't think they would really get it right. Um, and so, what, what are examples of this, the ways in which we make these choices? For instance, in creating and selecting the, the models I was talking about before, in establishing units of analysis of whatever kind of objects or sources we're interested in, in pinpointing a theory, for instance, of those objects or those, those texts. And again, my favorite example when I explain this is obviously uh, Patrick Dallas' um, Wheel of Text, which maybe we already presented to you today. Um, so in parallel to the idea of digitization we looked at before, so digitization is not creating a new thing, but it's creating a representation. Well, Patrick, in his theory of transcription, he says, well, in a way, transcription is a representation of the text that already exists. Um, and, and potentially, you could summarize these three main, uh, three main perspectives on text. So text as, as meaning, 
that is being conveyed in some kind of verbal uh, form and is then fixed in a document. And in between, you could identify other, other, other perspective on text. So they might be interested, for instance, in the rhetorical structure of a text, or does the CSS maybe as a version, or interested in the text as a version of a set of graph and themes and so on. Um, or indeed, the text as a visual object, as a complex science, that behind the linguistic information has meaning also in its visual um, structure, conveys meaning in the visual structure. That's why we have the wheel here. And the, the, I, I under, if I understand correctly, Patrick kind of uh, um, extracted from different theories of text these six main elements to also pinpoint to the fact that if you engage with digital transcriptions, for instance, you will depart from one of these perspectives, usually. Or if not, you'll have to consider which perspective you depart from. And based on the perspective you depart from, you will select certain elements in your model. Um, so it's just to give, again, an example of how you, you need to engage with these theories of text. So the agency means also engagement with interpreting, uh, interpretative uh, agent of the past, so with the literature, for instance. So when uh, we talk about meta-modeling, sometimes that's what we mean. So we look at how, no, no matter how interested you might be in a certain theory of text, we usually, in the humanities, have to kind of get grip with other theory of text to decide whether to exclude it or not in our model. So it's a, again, the digital humanities as in, in, uh, in, in, um, in parallel with the humanities is idea of the long shelf engagement with the literature, which we don't really always have in the uh, natural sciences, for instance, or art sciences. This is just, uh, I'm not going to talk about that, I think I talked about that before. In another sense, we also see the observers, not just, the, we don't point the lens also on ourselves, but we point the lens on those that will use the resources that we create after us. So in this sense, we also see the futures uh, via these lens, because we plan, we tend to creating resources to make sure we plan for reuse, for documentation, uh, the idea of sustainable technologies, uh, ideally community engagement with respect to standards. So I mentioned the TI, I mentioned the CDOC CRM, I mentioned various, various um, standards in my or community working on specific standards for the digital humanities and cultural heritage sector. So how, what, we, what we can conclude with due respect is that that specificity of object that I was talking about before, in digital humanity is always balanced out with the need for flexible, sustainable, and reusable resources. So there is always this tension, which is an interesting tension, between how can I make sure I'm really representing this very idiosyncratic text I'm interested in, and on the other hand, producing something that others can reuse, understand, uh, sustain for the future, maintain, link to, extract from, and so on. So, my last slide. So what do we see in conclusions um, through these lenses? Well, primarily, I think I, I tried to explain, we see those objects that we are interested in, the specificity of those objects, in detail and expanded form, but also distorted. And those distortions are also interesting to be aware of and to analyze. We see the medium itself, the lenses, so, so the instruments, the tools, the media, in those various uh, faceted ways I, I tried to, um, to highlight. We see ourselves as observers, as subjects, as agents, and interpreters. These are the three primary things that I, I try to reflect on. And of course, consequently, connected to this, um, not only we see those objects, but we see this process of abstraction, of identifying patterns, and commonalities, also across very different epistemic traditions that engage with primary sources, whether historical or well, historical in this case. Um, we also see, uh, or, or let's say, put the focus on other creators, whether they are uh, creators, let's say, interpreters of the past, so the literature we engage with, those that created the digital models before us, or traditional literature for that matter, uh, those around us, and that's why the digital humanities tend to be quite an open international community. You need to engage to see what others are doing at the same time in similar or connected problems, or. Uh, interpretative uh, challenges, and of course, as I said, on the, the future, those that will uh, potentially engage with that resource or with your models once you are gone or your resource is gone. And then last but not least, we engage or we see the power and limits of technology also within the social and environmental uh, sustainability framework. And I think that's it for me. Thank you.